We're pleased to have you with us, and now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this press conference, Richard Schickel of Time Magazine. Thank you. Good morning, and uh, welcome to the Family Plot Follies. Uh, we're, I am particularly pleased to be here. As some of you know, I'm uh, sometimes uh, what I like to think of as a critic, but I'm here less in my critical capacity than as a sometime uh, biographer, friend, and a longtime admirer of Alfred Hitchcock and his art. Um, I can't resist a, a kind of a brief critical comment, uh, which is that it seems to me that this film is uh, Hitch in one of his most entertaining moods, and yet uh, it seems to me also a film that takes up, as his films invariably do, certain themes that uh, have been repeated in his uh, life and in his career uh, almost from the very beginning. But uh, to begin, uh, Hitch on a kind of a practical note, um, I'm sure everyone would like to know uh, how long it takes you to uh, prepare and shoot and get ready for distribution a film of this sort. <coughs> well, Dick, before I answer that, I have to go back to your original comment, and that is uh, about one uh, doing similar themes all through one's career. I believe it was someone who said that self-plagiarism is style. <laughs> <laughs> Just so. <laughs> Just so. Uh, this particular job, just completed, took about a total of two years. <clears throat> that was one year in the writing. <clears throat> and while you may ask why so long as a year, um, I think most of the time was spent trying to avoid the cliché because invariably one would have said, oh, this has been done before. So um, ideas did not flow as freely as one would like and it was the uh, uh, effort to get something a little different, you know, crime is crime, whichever way you um, commit it. Um, whether it's a murder, theft, kidnapping, what have you, you're faced with that. The question is, it's like writing a scene where you say, man comes through the door. But the big question is, how? <laughs> uh, I think you've said uh, on a number of occasions that uh, it's important to you uh, to uh, be extraordinarily detailed, especially in terms of the visual aspects of the film, on paper uh, before you ever get to the uh, shooting stage. Well, people often ask this question. And I say uh, uh, I've made it a practice over the years, many years, to put a film down on paper. You see, people say to me, don't you ever improvise on the set while you are shooting? And I say, certainly not. With all those electricians around and everything, um, I would prefer to improvise in the office. It's a little cheaper anyway, isn't it? It's cheaper and it's quieter. <clears throat> and uh, after all, musicians are allowed to put their composition down on paper. And architects can put a building on paper. So why not a film? It's a visual thing. So a, a mere description uh, of the film on paper should suffice. I think the drawback that a lot of people suffer from is the difficulty in visualizing something. You see, you can't 
it's no good for a motion picture putting down on paper he wondered because how do you photograph wondering? <laughs> so what, what, what goes on paper is a description. Going back to, as I said, how he came through the door. On his face, <laughs> knees, or what? It does seem, I, I, in this morning's paper, uh, one of the stars of the picture, Bruce Dern, is quoted as saying that, in fact, uh, he found the very happy working with you that he found he had a lot of room himself uh, in his performance to go in directions uh, that uh, that he felt appropriate to his character that you were not restrictive in that sense with him. Well I'm not as a matter of fact uh, I have um, had um, occasions with actresses for example uh, who came to me extremely tearful and complaining they weren't being directed. So I said, well, I don't direct. There's the script. We put the film down on paper. The only thing I have to do with you is to tell you when you are doing it wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, some of them can get um, in very, very um, intense and much too intense. I remember Ingrid Bergman used to get very worked up and uh, say, oh, I don't know what to do here and so forth. And I used to say to her, Ingrid, it's only a movie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this is uh, only a television broadcast, but nonetheless, we have a lot of people out here uh, with, I imagine, a number of questions. So I would like to uh, open the floor here in Los Angeles, at least, uh, for uh, questions. Right here, first row. Bruce Russell of Reuters News Agency. What is the mandatory retirement age for a director in Hollywood? Um, I would say... Um Real 12, <laughs> <laughs> which will be told the end. Uh, this lady right here. Marlene Daly, Australian Consolidated Press. Mr. Hitchcock, you've introduced many new faces to the screen. What do you look for when you're searching for a performer? Uh, well, it depends upon the character. You know, um, of course, uh, in the old days, and I'm now going back to the 20s. The leading man had to be handsome, well-groomed, dapper. Uh, the woman had to be a blonde, a fluffy blonde. <laughs> <coughs> and uh, these were more or less stock characters. But of course today, uh, that isn't so. One tends as I did in the family plot, go for characters, purely characters. Uh, gentleman back here. Stanley Eichenbaum, San Francisco Examiner. Mr. Hitchcock, uh, this film has a great deal less violence, it seems to me, than any of your others. As a matter of fact, there seems to be uh, a deliberate move in the other direction. The one death in the film is accidental. Uh, there is no real violence in the film. Uh, I wondered if this was deliberate and why. Well, I don't, I've never been a believer in violence. For example, uh, <coughs> when, I, when I made the film Psycho, I deliberately made it in black and white to avoid showing blood running down a bathtub. And I've never been one for violence unless the story called for it. Uh, uh, showing blood, you know, there's nothing to it. Uh, it's just photography of blood. It doesn't necessarily contribute cinematically to what the scene is about. 
So therefore, I think these things should be avoided. What about the absence of bodies here is what I meant. Uh, the absence of what? Bodies. The absence of death, death and bodies. bodies in this film. You're saying that there's a, in this film as compared to... Bo you mean nudity? No. <laughs> you mean dead bodies? Dead bodies. Yes, dead they're, bodies. they're nude as well. <laughs> <coughs> Don't want them. They do, look, a dead body doesn't act. <laughs> uh, I, I think, though, there is a feeling, perhaps, uh, just in contrast to your previous film, Frenzy, yes. which, after all, does deal with a psychopath. That's right. Uh, I think is possible that what the gentleman's getting at is that, uh, in contrast, uh, this is uh, <coughs> a film in which... Uh, all the violence uh, is, in a sense, a violence of the mind. And perhaps you did deliberately veer away from the psychopathic theme to the rather clean jewel theft kind of thing. Uh, That's true. On the other hand, you see, there was kidnapping. And uh, the um, kidnapping was done uh, with as much decorum as possible. Mr. Hitchcock, since you brought up the subject of kidnapping, do you sometimes feel that there really isn't much room left for a suspense film when you have events like this morning's paper, kamikaze pilot trying to kill a uh, Japanese uh, financier, or the Patty Hearst kidnapping? Is it sometime, do you sometimes feel that real events have outpaced what you could possibly dream of in a suspense movie? Well, a suspense movie, at least from my point of view, is giving the audience information in advance. Not after the fact. You see, there's a great deal of difference between giving the audience the anticipation as against surprising them. A surprise takes ten seconds, but anticipation can take an hour. There's a big difference. But most people, you know, they make mystery films, which I don't. I call them mystifying films. Yes, but you don't, you're not really answering my question. I, I wondered if sometimes you feel that the real life dramas have sort of outpaced the film's possibility of exceeding that or even uh, giving the equivalent of that. No, she's saying the world is such a violent and uh, disturbing place. Is it difficult for you now? Yes, because we're fighting headlines all the time. To the degree, this question raised a question in my mind. Uh, it seems to me the crime of our current time is in fact kidnapping. There's been an enormous amount yes, of it. Yes, it is. Uh, is that to a is that in any way influence your choice of the kidnapping theme, or is it sort of <coughs> something that filters into your mind and uh, no, uh, I way? didn't want. I didn't say uh, I'd like to do a kidnapping film. Uh -huh. uh, what What interested me about a story like Family Plot was that it was two sides of a triangle meeting at a certain point. In other words. You, st you started at the bottom. It was like a triangle without a base. And gradually, they apparently had no association whatever. And as they came to their apex, that was the shape of the film. And the p climax, the apex came when these two totally unrelated elements came together, and they came together just as the leading lady rings a front door bell of the house which contains a kidnapped bishop. And that's what appealed to me, was the structure of this story. And the kidnapping and all those elements were, uh, uh, you know, uh, part of it but certainly no great inspiration to me. But the plot was. Are you, uh, have you ever done a film with a structure at all similar to this? No, this is the first time. Uh, yes, gentleman right here. Uh, Craig Moderno from Lawford Publishing Company. Oh, 
Directors such as Francis, Francois Truffaut and Brian De Palma have uh, made films that have been Hitchcock-like films. I wanted, that's what the critics have called them. I want to know if you happen to have seen any of uh, these directors' films and what uh, you may think of the influence you've had on directors. <coughs> I've seen the film, but I can't honestly say that I can see myself or one's technique in them. I think the one thing that Truffaut told me once, what he had uh, uh, learned from me was the subjective treatment. In other words, I'll give you an example of what, of, of, what, of what subjective treatment is. A picture like Rear Window. You get a close-up of a man, you cut to what he sees, and you cut back to his reaction. And the whole structure of that film was done on those lines. In other words, you use the camera or as the person who sees something. It's a definite three-piece structure. And that's what uh, Truffaut had learned. You see, it's like, it's like uh, when you see films of automobile crashes. The audience are on the sidewalk. They're never involved. Now in Family Plot, you are entirely with the audience, with the, the couple in a car that has lost control. And the whole uh, sequence is composed of close-ups of the people and the road ahead. In fact, I took a step further than they usually do in those sort of scenes. I didn't even include the dash or the window frame or anything. I just took close-ups of the people and the road ahead, which was the emotion they were feeling. I was photographing an emotion, not a viewpoint. So that was a step beyond the rear window concept. Yes, well, that lady. Oh, I'm sorry, this lady, yes. Yeah. I'm Nancy Anderson with McFadden Magazines and Copley News Service, but I'm also a grandmother of seven, and I think it's in this capacity I want to ask the question. Uh, because there's so little violence in the picture and it's such good suspenseful entertainment, it would be great for family groups, except for some of the very bawdy and blasphemous dialogue here and there. And has there been any thought of editing any of that out to increase your general audience appeal? Uh, not so far. Uh, the people speak uh, contemporaneously, you know. Uh, if you eliminated uh, that, I think you would cut down some of the quality of character in the two people. Fun? Yeah, uh, Mike Callahan, National Catholic Reporter. Um, the structure, it seems to me, or apparently, comes from the original novel. And I was curious, in your adaptation, one thing is to kind of visualize it, the kind of thing you're describing. But do you, um, when adopting from another medium, do you make large changes in the, um, uh, in the original medium? And how do you, uh, do you ever consciously kind of put in Hitchcock uh, themes or touches to... Uh, <coughs> I read the work. book twice, perhaps, and never look at it again, and start from scratch. Because if you look at a book uh, and you try to translate it, uh, it's very hard to do. Good literature does not make good pictures. That's been shown again and again. <coughs> I think we have time for this gentleman right here. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, James Mead, San Diego Union. You, you were a very heavy user of coincidence, and I wonder if you feel that coincidence actually does influence human lives in reality, or it's a fictional uh, person's device to, to make things progress, either in writing or in filming and so forth. Oh, I think coincidence belongs to ordinary life. There's a phrase very often used in coincidence which says, fancy meeting you. 
<laughs> of all people. Good morning. My name is Richard J. Anobile, and uh, I was wondering, during the production of Family Plot, you uh, had an implant operation for a pacemaker. When you returned to work, did you find that this altered your normal work pattern, or did you look at the film or your no, subject matter differently? No effect whatsoever. I'm not even aware that it's there. Fabulous. Uh, time for one more. This gentleman here. Yeah, Tony Pizer, UCLA Daily Bruin. If I might go back to that car chase for a moment. At what point did you decide to have uh, the emphasis more on the humor than the terror or the potential terror in that scene? I think the humor emerged uh, through the players, actually. It, it's a very fine line between humor and uh, tragedy. But really what that car chase did, it combined both elements, danger, uh, humor, and uh, the thrill of the thing. Uh, I think it's uh, time now for us to uh, go to the first of the <coughs> other cities. For those of you who didn't get a chance in this first go-around here in uh, Burbank, uh, we will be coming back here for uh, uh, more questions from you as we will from the other cities. But at this point, uh, I'd like to uh, call upon Jerry Evans in New York, who has uh, arranged uh, his questions, I'm sure, in an extraordinarily intelligent order. Jerry, good morning, and uh, could we have your first question? Are you even there? celebrating the 50th anniversary, and I hope that you're both in very good health. And may I ask if you have a new picture working? Uh, I, we're having a little trouble hearing the questions up here on the stage, but as I picked it up, they're uh, asking if you uh, have another picture uh, in, in the works at this point. No, the answer is definitely not. Nothing at all. Well, perhaps I could ask you, uh, is the process uh, one of uh, slow gestation, or how is it that you uh, go about seeking out material of your sort? It comes from all, it comes through uh, literary agents, it comes uh, through book reviews uh, from various countries. Mm -hmm. In other words, Family Plot was an English book originally. Mm -hmm. <coughs> it, um, one thing we never do, we never actually take material direct from a writer. Mm -hmm. It's too dangerous. If it arrives in an envelope, that, by that, we feel it, we weigh it. <laughs> Not to get the quality of the material inside. Um, but the fear of plagiarism, you see. I must digress to tell you a story of um, a little actor, an actor called, English one, called Alfie Bass. He played in the film with um, Michael Caine called Alfie. And um, he was a little cockney type. And he was in a group of three, and he was a little too short, so somebody sent for a script for him to stand on and <laughs> raise him up a little. And the cameraman was very, very slow. And finally, little Alfie Bass said, Who wrote this script? It doesn't half hurt your feet. <laughs> uh. Jerry, do we have another uh, question from New York? Well, we're moving, I see, we're moving on to uh, Chicago and to uh, Mike Kaplan. Uh, hello, Chicago, are you there? And can we hear you? Hello, Mr. Hitchcock. This is Alex Steen of the Milwaukee Sentinel. Uh, getting away from the film uh, per se, you have a reputation for being quite a practical joker in your own part. Uh, I wonder if you might tell us what was the best practical joke ever played on you. 
On me? No one would dare. Never. <laughs> Never. The best practical joke, one of the best I ever made, was to give a dinner where all the food was blue. <laughs> and uh, I think Gertrude Lawrence was one of the guests. It was in a private room above a London hotel. Also Sir Gerald du Maurier, who was the leading actor on the London stage. And uh, we started off with blue cream soup, <laughs> blue trout, blue chicken, and then we had blue peaches with blue ice cream. Uh, it was very successful. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> Do we have another question from uh, Chicago? Um, Christine Nile in the Chicago Daily News. Did you consider any different endings for the film? It seemed to me that there was that huge inheritance sitting there with Kathleen Nesbitt. And um, did you ever think about maybe Bruce Dern posing as, as the son himself and, and making off with the money? No, never did. Never thought about any other ending except the one that we have in the picture. Because... Um, <clears throat> There's no drama in money. Much. <laughs> <laughs> Only if you don't have it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Is there another question from Chicago? Uh, Gene Sisko from the Chicago Tribune. I'm, uh, right now in the movie industry, it seems that violent pictures uh, sell day in and day out the best. I'm wondering how that makes you feel about the profession that you've given your life to. I'm wondering if you're very optimistic about the future of the movie business and if so can you point to either people or trends that make you optimistic well of course as you know we're going to have changes in the future uh, to some extent I gather there'll be a certain amount of home movies through the use of uh, disco vision you know, many years ago, uh, I attended a New York Herald Tribune forum in front of about 300 school teachers, and this was when television was first starting. And uh, I was asked, did I think television would affect the theaters? I said it might a little, but on the other hand, the thing is go that is really going to be affected is the cloak and suit business because women will want to go out with a new dress on. It reminds me of those pictures which I call sink to sink pictures. The husband comes home and he finds himself confronting his wife who is washing dishes at a sink and he takes compassion on her and says look take off your apron put a nice dress on we'll get a babysitter we'll go out have dinner and take in the movie and she's overjoyed at the prospect of getting out of the house so they park eventually get the sitter park the car they have dinner and they sit in the movie house and the wife looks at the screen, and what does she see? A woman washing dishes at the sink. <laughs> <laughs> I take it you think there's very little future in that line of work. Well, uh, <clears throat> I, I think people will want to go out. Otherwise, it means that if, it's, if they're going to stay at home all the time, think you're going to have a revolt of by, by the wives. <laughs> Do we have another question from out in the Middle West? follow up on that question. What about the quality of filmmaking? Um, I was trying to suggest that um, it seems that we're getting into very crude, broad, violent strokes with uh, sharks biting people, uh, things blowing up, fire spreading, and none of the subtlety that you were talking about that gave you so much pleasure in the making of this film. Are there people that you see working, either young or old people working, that uh, give you the kind of optimism, or are we going to just get blown away with big action pictures? No, I think big action pictures will have their day. We always had them, 
uh, for the last 20 or 30 years. And uh, we shall still have them uh, intermingled with the more intimate picture. Uh, <coughs> another question. Augusta Callery, Fort Wayne Journal Gazette. Um, I noticed in this movie that there was more symbolism than usual, like with the names uh, Rainbird and Shoebridge and Blanche, and the two kidnapping victims were like one was the bishop and the other was the Greek Constantine. And I wondered how much of this symbolism you intentionally kept in there, how much was from the book, or how you feel about that. I don't think that symbolism meant a lot to this story. They just happened to be names and types, really. <clears throat> I don't look really for symbolism any more than I look for messages in a film. Wasn't it Samuel Goldwyn who once said, messages are for Western Union? It, it is true, though, uh, Hitch, really from, uh, it seems to me, the beginning of your career in film, that uh, in particular, uh, religious symbols have played a part in a rather subtle way in, uh, um, in your films. That may be true, but uh, I don't think... Uh, uh, in a very, very conscious way. Uh -huh. Well, one notices, for example, in this film, the, uh, the business of the abduction of the bishop right from uh, a place of, normally we think of as uh, the most secure and uh, yes. serene place that, that we could possibly go, that is to say a church. Um, is that, uh, we understand that uh, disorder can intrude into... Uh, uh, even a sacred place? Is that a, a view? <coughs> oh, definitely, yes. Uh, I, would, I would regard that as a piece of counterpoint, really. Could you explain that a little bit? Well, uh, you know, of all places to uh, uh, go would be to a cathedral, uh, just as much as you might have a murder in a theater which you've done a few times. Yes, which, uh, again, it's, it's an effort to avoid the cliché. You see, <clears throat> for example, in that film, North by Northwest, I had a situation where Cary Grant was supposed to be put, quote, on the spot. And, uh, what was the cliché? The cliché was that he would stand under a lamp on, the, on, on an intersection, bathed in a pool of light from the lamppost. Then you'd cut to a black cat slithering by. <laughs> then you'd cut to a window and the curtains would part and somebody would peer out. <laughs> it would be midnight, the distant clock would chime. So I decided this is all cliché. I'm going to do it in the open air, in the bright sun, with nowhere for him to shelter, and apparently no place from which the assassin would turn up. So I chose flat, open country, and where does the assassin come from? Out of the sky. Now all that was done to avoid the cliché, and not only that, the, the attack was contrapuntal by the use of the crop duster. Mm -hmm. Now, another important point is if you use a crop duster, it must dust crops. So he went to hide in a cornfield, and the crop duster came over and, and drove him out in front of the road. So that, there was a, 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 an example of doing an attempted murder in very unconventional surroundings. Right. Do we have another question, please? Mr. Hitchcock, Roger Ebert from the Chicago Sun-Times. The other day I got a call from a graduate student who's doing a paper on the use of the staircase as a motif in the films of Hitchcock. And I suggested that she write to you. How would you respond to a question like that or to academic criticism in general? <coughs> 
I think the staircases are made to go up and down. <laughs> and therefore, they become very photogenic. That they, that they rise, they take a figure up and down instead of uh, keeping a figure on the flat. I suppose the most famous staircase I ever used was for a film I made in 19... Uh, hold on to your breath, 26. And there it was a film about Jack the Ripper and Jack the Ripper had to go out at night about 2 a.m. And the landlady of the rooming house in which he lived sat up in bed and listened. And I had a staircase built four flights high and we had to photograph her from the studio roof. And looking down the well, you saw the continuous handrail and just a white hand sliding down the whole way. Of course, today with sound, we would do creaks on the stairs. But that was the most valuable use of a staircase under those needful conditions. Uh, another question. Indiana Post Tribune. Mr. Hitchcock, I enjoyed the film very much, but I noticed one scene that seemed all by itself separated from the rest of the film, and that was the second scene in the cemetery when the camera came away and you saw them, like, working their way through a maze, and it seemed rather a romantic kind of image that you had created. Is there any particular reason for it? No, it had a practical value. It showed a kind of a chase, and I was possibly influenced by the paintings of Mondrian, which are a series of lines, uh, straight lines converging into various squares and turns. And I felt it was just a fresh way of doing a small chase instead of just cutting from one figure to another, or cutting to the feet. Uh, it was a more spectacular way, but nevertheless, its purpose was to show that um, uh, our hero was getting nearer and nearer to his goal, which was the woman. I also thought what was rather witty about that scene was the fact that uh, he never left the path that he was no. on. He could have cut cross lots, as it were, and he <coughs> did not. The, the notion of staying on the path, I thought, was kind of humorous. Yes, well, it was. It was humorous to the extent that you do try and preserve in a cemetery some decorum. Exactly so. <laughs> um, is there another question? Charles Callery, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Journal, Gazette. You mentioned that you don't intentionally go in for symbolism, though there would be, say, in the names, quite a bit of symbolism on the part of the writer, such as Adamson's name, the son of Adam, and the good and bad symbolism. And you did put Blanche, for example, in a white car, which goes along with the good angle there. Was that intentionally, or how did that just happen? <coughs> they got you now, Hitch. <laughs> the white car was definitely used to let the audience know whose car it was. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things they make mistakes in film, they get an audience confused. They make an audience say, now wait a minute, wait a minute, which car is whose and what? These have got to be identified. And if you're going to get suspense, You've got to make everything very clear to an audience, especially uh, where the diamond was hidden in the house. I had to make that, if I may say so, crystal clear. <laughs> but an audience wondering is not an audience emoting. That is why uh, the clothing or the types of people you use must be extremely distinctive so that the audience know who is who 
and they must not wonder. They must not nudge each other in the theatre uh, and, and uh, get confused. I had a very interesting story showing audience confusion where uh, one of my assistants went to see a performance of a musical Sweet Charity and in the intermission when the lights went up behind her were two uh, women with their husbands and one woman said to the other oh I do like her don't you and the other woman said well, I've always liked Barbara Streisand. <laughs> <coughs> so one of the men said, What are you talking about? Barbara Streisand is in Funny Girl. So the other woman said, Well, this is Funny Girl, isn't it? <laughs> <coughs> That's confusion. <laughs> well, we're going to try and... Uh solve some earlier confusion. Uh, apparently the line to New York is now open, so uh, we will leave Chicago briefly and try once again to uh, get in touch with my colleagues in New York and uh, with Jerry Evans. Do we have a question from New York? Uh, we are awfully sorry, New York. We still can't hear you, and uh, we're going to keep working on that. Uh, we will now, however, go to Dallas uh, uh, to Bill Burton, who is organizing our seance down there. Uh, Bill, do we have a question uh, from Dallas? Uh, yes. Uh, Don Safran of the Dallas Times-Herald. Mr. Hitchcock, in your reference uh, before to self-plagiarism, uh, at what point does it cease being style and become a cliché? Well, uh, the cliché belongs to anyone except me. <laughs> uh, well, there's a brief answer. Uh, next question. Uh, Mr. H Mr. Hitchcock, Patrick Taggart of the Austin, Texas American Statesman. Uh, you, perhaps more than any director I've seen lately, are generous to women, both in the number of roles you give to them and, and the kind of parts they play. Is this a conscious effort of yours, or is this just part of, of being Alfred Hitchcock? Uh, well, you know, uh, the use of women in pictures is historical. <laughs> and uh, and inevitable. Um, I've often been accused of using cool blonde women. I think this is because I personally, on the screen, have an objection to uh, the type of woman who wears her sex round her neck like jewelry. Great big baubles, I think they would be called. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I don't think it's interesting to label, put a label on a woman and say, oh, she's sexy. I think it has to be discovered whether the woman who can look like a beaky-nosed school teacher, and uh, you'll eventually discover it when you are both alone in a taxi. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, uh, I think that the, uh, the women should be discovered in the course of the story. The cool blonde type, <coughs> I think, comes from Northern Europe. Scandinavians, the Scottish, the English, the Norwegians, and perhaps North Germany. I think the further south you go in Europe, the more obvious they are. I won't go so far as to say 
they are obvious enough to walk around carrying a rose by its stem in her mouth. But um, I think the sex should be discovered in the course of the story. You can't walk along the street, walk along New York in Fifth Avenue and point to every type you see and say, well, she's sexy. She's not sexy or he is. It has got to be found out. And I think that's part of storytelling. One thing that uh, does occur to me is that uh, perhaps what the gentleman was referring to is there's been a lot of talk of late that there are not or have not been as many good roles for women in films in recent years as there has been in uh, past years. And <coughs> which leads me to point two, which is that there's a very good role for a very good actress in Family Plot, namely Barbara Harris. Yeah. And I thought perhaps you might want to comment first on the general point and then on the more specific point of, uh, of Barbara's performance. Well, uh, the, the general point is that it's true. They haven't written so many uh, stories about women. I think the, the stories about women go back to uh, the end of the 19th century. Who was the great French playwright, Sardou, who wrote the plots for some operas and so forth. And he said, Sardou, he was preceded by Scree, but Sardou said, torture the woman as a piece of dramatic. And the trouble is today, uh, we don't torture the women enough. <laughs> <coughs> is that to, to the degree that uh, suspense requires, uh, I mean, what you're saying there is that the woman in peril is in some sense uh, more attractive to us or more attractive to an audience than, than perhaps a man in Paris. Well, uh, which is the, in, allegedly the innocent, the, in, well, uh, you, you the helpless. The, the earliest days, Dick, the, the earliest days in films, who was tied to the railroad tracks? Just the so. woman. It was always the woman who was. What, what was the serial called in the silent days? The Perils of Pauline. Nobody was interested in the perils of George. <laughs> and uh, all through we've had uh, the woman in trouble. But somehow, maybe it's due to women's lib that they can look after themselves more than they were used to. Uh, but it is true that there are more men uh, than there are women, but I believe that's, that really is due uh, to the fact that uh, customs have changed, that women are no longer what used to be called the weaker sex. <laughs> we have another question from uh, Dallas. Yes, Eric Gerber, Houston Post. Uh, I noticed in the credits last night there was no producer listed, and I'm curious about that, and secondly, I'm given to understand that Roy Finnis was uh, originally cast in the role of Arthur Adamson. I'd like to know if that's true and more or less what happened. Well, the, the reason there's no producer credit, because I'm the producer, but I've never taken credit for it. And I have, in my time, done some writing, but I've never taken a writing credit. In regard to the actor, that was miscasting on my part. I felt that he was too nice. He, did, he didn't have enough sinister quality. And that's how I came to make the change. And I chose a man <coughs> who was more sinister, who had previously played Robert F. Kennedy. <laughs> uh. We have another question from Dallas, please. One, two, three. Uh, this is Patrick Taggart again from Austin. Uh, you said that you have not, uh, have any, you don't have any specific projects right now, but will there be a 54th film by Alfred Hitchcock? Definitely, yes. Next question. Jerry Rush from the Arkansas Gazette. 
I've enjoyed your uh, suspense very much, Mr. Hitchcock. I'd like to know if you would consider doing a uh, suspenseful western, perhaps with John Wayne. <coughs> no, because um, the trouble uh, uh, with my doing other types of films is that I, there's not enough detail in them. In other words, I haven't any idea what a loaf of bread costs in a western. Just as much as people say, why don't you make a costume picture? And I say, well, the trouble is that no one in a costume picture ever goes to the toilet. <laughs> In other words, do you feel that uh, suspense derives, you've, you've said before, suspense derives from audience knowledge, but in some way uh, I felt in conversing with you that uh, details about everything from the, uh, the train schedules of Europe to uh, yes. what we were talking about yesterday, the herring run in, uh, in England, yeah. that somehow that, that stuff, though it may not be specifically uh, related to the film, in some ways enriches your... Uh, ability to, to make the film and some can can you talk about that uh, what 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 is that n need for detail that you may not specifically use on the screen uh, well the need for detail is to create a greater audience identification that the, the audience are familiar <coughs> with certain things yeah I've never seen a man try on a Stetson in a West mm-hmm I've never seen him in the store buying what they used to call chaps. Uh -huh. I don't mean English chaps, <laughs> old chap and all that. I mean those furry things. Never seen anything like that. Do you have another question, please? Uh, Patty Moore, the Dallas Morning News. Uh, Mr. Hitchcock, I understand that Shadow of the Doubt is one of your favorite pictures. Could you tell us why? Well, well, because, first of all, a lot of pictures up to that time had been made on the back lot. And this time, uh, with Thornton Wilder, we uh, eventually sought out a town in Northern California, just about 50 miles north of San Francisco. And we went and stayed in the town and got to know the price of everything, the houses, the bank, and all the detail. And then we went back to the town and shot the whole film there. And I found that very, very satisfying. Uh, we even, uh, the townspeople were so good to us that they allowed us to take the regular bus, including all the passengers, off its main route and down the route in which we were shooting. And uh, we got tremendous help. And uh, it also satisfied me in this respect. It was a melodrama, but it was full of character and various characters. The, the central figure was a murderer, but attractive. And uh, in many ways, uh, in many aspects, family plot comes close to that in terms of character, not necessarily in terms of crime committed, because in the case of Shadow of a Doubt, the crimes had already been committed. Do we have another question then from Dallas? Mr. Hitchcock, this is John Buston from the Austin Citizen. Uh, I recall, I believe, that uh, originally uh, Family Plot was entitled Deceit. Uh, could you tell us uh, what went into the change of title? Well, I felt the word deceit suggested a bedroom farce. It suggested, uh, it was rather a mild word. It, it didn't carry any meaning with it, uh, pictorially when one began to think about deceit, there you had the woman in bed, the husband entering the bedroom, and the lover secreted behind a curtain where there was a row of the women's shoes and two big 
boots of the man standing out. And that to me epitomized the word deceit. It wasn't good, I didn't think. We have, we have time for another uh, question from Dallas. Uh, this is John Buston again. Uh, you were speaking of symbolism, and I recall uh, in North by Northwest, uh, kind of a famous uh, symbol that, that uh, you created uh, with the train tunnel. Uh, you, you recall that, and, and uh, if so, could you explain a little uh, about what you had in mind? <laughs> <laughs> I think that comes under the heading of pornography ahead of its time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have another question from Dallas? Another question from Dallas. Okay, we're going to try one more time uh, for, uh, for New York and uh, hope that the lines are finally clear. Uh, can uh, you hear us, New York, and can we hear you? Graciela Lecube for Buen Hogar, Latin America. Uh, Mr. Hitchcock, uh, you always talk about surprise about your movies, and I was surprised for two little shots. Why did you show yourself in a shadow, and why did you have Barbara Harris at the end wink at us instead of you winking at us like you're doing from the poster. Well, um, uh, Barbara Harris really winked because she was telling us that she was not psychic because while being carried through to the cellar, the uh, sodium pentothal or whatever they stuck her with hadn't taken, so she posed as being uh, unconscious and she actually heard a reference to the chandelier by the two kidnappers. Uh, what was the other part of the question? About your, yourself in shadow. Oh in, in shadow, in that, was sheer, that was sheer modesty. <laughs> uh, another reason was that uh, it was very short so that I wouldn't have to uh, uh, suffer the indignity of being an actor for too long. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Tom McElfresh, the Cincinnati Inquirer. Mr. Hitchcock, is there a, maybe a MacGuffin gone wrong? It seemed to me Karen Black put the wig into the refrigerator when they returned. Why? Well, when she came to put it on, it was nice and cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's also a, an odd place uh, to put a wig, just it at is, the simplest really, level. Yeah. Uh, next question. Roberta Putzik, Buffalo Courier Express. Uh, earlier, another questioner described you as being Alfred Hitchcock. At this stage in your life, do you ever think about being Alfred Hitchcock, a person that uh, all of us everywhere revere and admire? Do you have any philosophical comments on that? What's it like to be Alfred Hitchcock? <laughs> uh, not very comfortable. Uh, I don't know. It's, um, I'm uh, somewhat of a loner. Um, I don't um, flaunt myself publicly unless there are occasions like this, but um, I suppose one must be honest and say it's very pleasant when the film turns out to be all right, but when the film isn't good, uh, then it's a very miserable condition. <laughs> Next question. Mr. Hitchcock, Norma McLean Stoop, After Dark. Shots that interested me in family plot were when you had the camera not only focus on, but hover on, finger marks around light switches and closet handles. Was that 
because of your love for detail or was it symbolic? Finger marks around the... She picked, noticed, the uh, lady noticed a, a lot of finger marks well, uh, around the wall switches. I, I think it's very hard to uh, switch on lights and leave a full fingerprint. It's just a flick, that's all it is, and probably would end up... Next question. Mr. Hitchcock, Norma McLean, Duke, After Dark. Shots that interested me in family plot were when you had the camera not only focus on, but hover on finger marks around light switches and closet handles. Was that because of your love for detail or was it symbolic? Finger marks around the... She picked, noticed, uh, this lady noticed a, a lot of finger marks well, uh, around the wall I, I think it's very hard to uh, switch on lights and leave a full fingerprint. It's just a flick, that's all it is, and probably would end up in the eyes of the police as a smudge. And uh, but there was no other reason. There was no uh, symbolism attached to it, except that a switch is a symbol of light. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have another question. John, John Simon, New York Magazine. Mr. Hitchcock, do you, does the fact that the acting in this film in Family Plot tends to be more of the overstated, mugging kind, rather than your usual cool, understated kind of acting. Does this mean that you're losing confidence in the audience and in their ability to understand unless such over-explicitness is used? No, I, I don't think I think the uh, if there's any uh, excess of expression it's due to the characters of our two leading people, as opposed to the more placid features of our kidnappers. I think it's a matter of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, Barbara Harris and uh, Bruce Dern were rather extroverts in their way whereas the other two were more secretive. It also strikes me as that the other two were more confident in themselves and thus uh, not necessarily yes. in, a, in, a, in a state that of agitation. Well, these two people were chasing around and not really knowing yes. what was happening to them or around them. Right. And it's, it strikes me as, as fairly natural for them to be a little more... Also, they're perhaps not as actually bright uh, as the other no. people. No, they're not. They're certainly not what you would call sophisticated people. That's right. Do we have another question, please? Uh, this is Graciela Lecouve again. You said before that actresses come to you intense, very worked out, tearful. What about the actors? How do they come to you? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite follow the question. I'd like to hear Could we have the question again, please? Uh, yes. Um, before, in answering the questions of somebody in California, you described that some actresses come to you very intense, very worked out, and cheerful. And I wonder, what is the reaction of the actors when they come to you? Uh, she's wondering, you, you had said before that some actresses uh, uh, come to you tearfully and say, uh, you, you know, you're not uh, Tear, directing. Tearful. Right, not directing yeah. enough. What yeah. about, she's asking, I think, how about uh, actors, uh, the males? Uh, have you ever had a tearful actor? No, they don't, actor? no, they don't, they're not um, tearful people. Uh. It's only the women. <laughs> We're back to the weaker sex. Right. Well, it's, you can use it when you need it, I guess. Yes. Uh, do we have another question, please? You ever make that remark that actors are like children and should be treated accordingly? It's cattle, not children. Cattle. <laughs> uh, 
we're back to the uh, the famous cattle question. No. Uh, would you like to run through it one more time? <laughs> no, I, I uh, have said that um, I, you know, an actor is something like a child. The interesting thing is that they spend, I would say, 75% of their day sitting in front of a mirror. Because you'll find on any studio stage, the actor will go, after shooting a scene, will go straight to his dressing room and sit in his chair. And the chair is always facing the mirror. And then like the Queen Ant, the various people start doing things to the hair, the face is patted, and uh, they are treated almost like children, and uh, some of this must stick. Very likely. <laughs> Do we have another question, please? I'm sorry, we, we really can't hear it. Could you get the microphone closer or whatever? You have been quoted from time to time as saying you do not like to take photographs of people talking. And yet your new film begins with two relatively long sequences establishing the four principal characters. Did you consider another way of opening this film? Here's the uh, question. <clears throat> yes, do you see, what you are dealing there in the story of this kind is what we call the springboard situation. And that must be laid out perfectly clearly to the audience. And uh, it calls for a certain amount of explanation and words and so forth. I remember many years ago, and it's always a very hard scene to do. I remember years ago I made a picture, 39 steps, and there I had the springboard situation of a woman spy describing her objective. And I found that I had to shoot the scene three times in order to get it spontaneous and clear to the audience. And I think um, uh, the audience must be made comfortable at the beginning so that then once you've given them all the information they require, then you can start to be purely cinematic and start to tell your story in pictures. The only thing wrong with the silent picture was that actors or characters opened their mouths and no sound came out. <laughs> Otherwise, it was the ideal thing, even in those days, to dispense with titles. I remember I was working on the Ufa lot in 1924, and they were making a film with Emil Jannings called The Last Laugh. And their objective in those days was to do without titles. They only allowed one title in the whole picture, and that was to announce an epilogue to the picture. But otherwise, uh, Murnau was the director, and uh, they went through the whole film without a single word of explanation. Did you feel uh, in the very long opening sequence of Family Plot. I felt two things. One was that it was for you perhaps an interesting exercise to see uh, how long you could sustain uh, that remarkable long monologue of, of Barbara Harris's. And second of all, I thought just possibly you were having on a previous success, namely The Exorcist, just slightly having a joke at its uh, expense. Is there any, any truth in either of those suppositions? I don't it? think so, no. I think that uh, it was as near a, what one supposed was the sales as possible, with the necessary words. Uh, 
Do we have another question from uh, New York? Mr. Hitchcock, Tom McElfresh again. You said earlier that the humor in the car sequence emerged in the playing. Did it come as a surprise, as an enrichment uh, of characters that you had conceived perhaps in another way? Uh, had there, were there other s such surprises if, there were, if they were in this film? Or have there been instances where the shape of films have changed because of things you discovered on the set in performances, in earlier films? Not really. In that particular <coughs> car chase, the humor emerged uh, by the uh, actions of the characters in the car. You see, uh, strictly speaking, the car sequence was created uh, to get the audience to feel that ride. That is why after the first two cuts, looking out of the front of the car, I eliminated the dashboard, the hood, and only showed the road ahead. So the cutting backwards and forwards was just our two people and the road. Because if you found yourself in that particular position, realistically, you would be completely unaware of the car. And at the same time, the characters bouncing around as they did was a blend of humor and horror. And it just showed the fine line. Now, if we hadn't had those two particular types in the car, uh, you would have had a, a real, uh, a, a, what I would term, a, a physical ride instead of a comic one. And that's where the characters emerge, by the position in which they found themselves. Uh, next question. Uh, John, John Simon again. Mr. Hitchcock, leaving aside other kinds of symbolism, is there some kind of religious significance in the fact that what breaks the impact, the momentum of Bruce Dern's car is a large wooden cross which they mow down and which slows them down and that later Barbara Harris is tipped off by the fact that a bishop's robes, not just anybody's clothes, are revealed to her as sticking out of the car door. Is there some message of salvation of religious uh, uh, nature involved? Uh, <coughs> Mr. Simon, I don't think I'm that religious. <laughs> <laughs> so I doubt that. I don't, I don't think I intended any actual symbolism. If, if, it were, if they were there, they were in a sense accidental. Or, uh, or at least unconscious. Sometimes. Yes. Uh, do we have another question? I can't, uh, can't hear yeah, you. Yeah, Mr. Hitchcock, I noticed that you and Alma are having your 50th wedding anniversary this year. I hope you're both in good health. Very much so, thank you. And a clear conscience. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. That's it. Los Angeles, uh, lots of hands up. Uh, right over there. Yeah, you. Uh, Bill Gallo from the Rocky Mountain News in Denver. Mr. Hitchcock, can you tell us something about the um, early encounters, perhaps in, perhaps in your childhood, with fear and evil that perhaps um, became the material for your films later? Uh, yeah, encounters with evil. Uh, as a child, uh, were there encounters with. Uh, evil or uh, uh, displeasure, discomfort or anything that has led, no. led you to your kind of work? No, I think that um, uh, the English have always treated crime as literature. If you go back as far as Conan Doyle, Wilkie Collins, whereas in America 
it never has been first class literature. It's true we've had uh, Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler, but not as many as they've had in England. We've had John Buck and we've had Agatha Christie, Mrs. Belloc Lowndes, and, uh, you know, dealing with uh, uh, ghastly murders and yet to meet them. Uh, they're the mildest people. Had, had you read much of this literature as a child? Uh, a fair amount, yes. Uh -huh. Oh, yes. I personally have never, if I may say so, been associated with evil. <laughs> to tell you the truth, I'd t be too scared to. <laughs> right there, this gentleman. Uh, uh, Richard Simon, Sacramento Union. Uh, Mr. Hitchcock, there's a certain amount of racy dialogue between Bruce Dern and Barbara Harris in this film. Does that proceed strictly out of the characters conceived, or is it a response to the growing per permissiveness in motion pictures? Characters entirely, sure. Isn't it fair to say, though, that uh, to the degree that we are a little more permissive oh, we about are language, permissive, that uh, we are enabled to perhaps uh, get into some realms of character that Mm -hmm. Previously, we might not have yes, been able sure, to. Yes, sure, sure. Right here. Carol Bloss, Excel Springer Publications, Germany. Uh, Mr. Hitchcock, if you were not Alfred Hitchcock, I wouldn't dare ask this question for putting a big uh, foot in my mouth. But I noticed that you're wearing a black suit and a black tie. Are you trying to put us in a somber mood with that? Uh, what is the symbolism behind that? <laughs> It is a form of dignity. <laughs> <laughs> this gentleman right here. Yes, uh, Jorge Camara, The Herald of Mexico. Uh, my question deals with the uh, way, uh, with your way of working. It would seem that the creative process, all the improvisation, really takes place while you're writing your film. After that, it would only be a matter of photographing what has been written. Uh, do you, uh, is there a creative process while you're uh, shooting your film, or how does that work? No, for you? no. People say to me, do you ever improvise on the set? And I say no. Any improvisations are made in the office while the film is being put on paper. So is there really interest in you? I mean, to improvise on the set, with all those electricians and carpenters around. Uh, I personally don't see how it's done. I mean, imagine a, 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 a composer with sh sheets of blank lines in front of him and a hundred-piece orchestra. And he's thinking, and then he calls up, he said, Flute, give me a note, would you? And look. You get the note and he writes it down. <laughs> That's what inspira uh, 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 improvisation is on the set, and I don't believe in it. Uh, yes, right here. Yes. Yeah. You said about the actors, after their, after their uh, sequences, to their sets, to look at themselves in the mirror. Do you find the same thing with the actresses? Are they as vain? The actor? Are the actresses as vain oh, as the actors? Of know. course, they have to be. They have to be. They all go in front of that mirror. Three quarters of their life, their, their, their professional life, is in front of that mirror. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this lady back here hasn't had a question in the red, yes. With regard to what you said earlier about uh, attention to detail, suggests that uh, you have a great respect for authenticity. Is that true? Yes. Would you please define authenticity for us? Well, authenticity is a street outside the studio. It's there. And yet it is fair to say, I think, that in this picture, you have deliberately not located it in a recognizable city. Right. Uh, why is that? Well, uh, so many cities are recognizable now. Um, you know, we have the tall buildings, and uh, they are not terribly distinctive, like European cities are. Uh -huh. If you go to 
Copenhagen, you know you're in Denmark. Mm -hmm. In other words, you'd prefer to create, at this point, your own city <coughs> out of the elements of other cities. Yes, sure. Uh, yes, you have an answer. Uh, Yanni Begakis, Tokyo, Japan. Mr. Hitchcock, in the past you have made also trailers that follow the pictures as interesting. Is there a special trailer for Family Plot this time? Yes, there is, yes. Um, this lady back here in the pink. Yes, Nancy Anderson again. Uh, uh, if for some reason one of your pictures had to be completely obliterated from the memory of man, which one would you choose to erase forever? <laughs> if, it were, if it were essential, it wouldn't be erased. Uh, all of your pictures. This lady asked, which one you would like to obliterate from memory forever? <laughs> one had to be erased. I think it's a picture called Champagne. Why? Why that one? Because it was started without a script. <laughs> <laughs> and, it was, and it was improvised the whole way through. Uh, I'll take one more question here. The gentleman in the yellow shirt hasn't had a chance before. Like Vancouver Sun. You said no one had ever played a practical joke on you. I was wondering if the story is true or apocryphal that Gable and Lombard once buried a shrunken head in your yard, which was discovered when Mrs. Hitchcock complained to Lombard that you were having marital difficulties. No, what actually happened was that we rented a house where uh, Gable and Lombard had previously lived. And they came to dinner, and uh, Clark described how he went to South America and, ca and bought, I think in Ecuador, a shrunken head. And somebody, somebody told them it was very, very unlucky. So they drove up to Mulholland Drive and um, threw it out of the car by the roadside. And they got back home, and they still pondered about the uh, uh, evil that um, this head might uh, c create over them. So they went back again and retrieved the head and brought it home and buried it in their garden. And it, as, uh, uh, at this moment, the moment Clark said, and it's buried and we buried it again. And, and Carol jumped up and says, Jesus, this is in this garden, <laughs> which it was. <laughs> uh, I think that we are supposed to go back to uh, Chicago uh, for some more questions from that city. Uh, what's, your, uh, what's your first question, Chicago? Um, Bob Curtis, just Hobart, Indiana. I enjoyed the movie thoroughly for the first thing, but uh, I became rather curious to the one scene with the in the cafe when the priest sat down with the young lady. Uh, I realize you love details. Uh, I was wondering what type of detail was this? <laughs> uh, <coughs> it was the detail of religious reward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm certain he was an Anglican priest in any event. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Uh, the next question, please. Charles Calvary, Fort Wayne Journal Gazette. You mentioned that you go in for great human details in these films, yet I found in this film much less than in others, in fact, a certain isolation. You isolated uh, the characters from their environment. You tried to make it seem like they weren't connected to practically anybody else in the film, and I didn't find all of these human details outside as in other films. I think it's a rather interesting question. The, the well, the, of po the, po the point is that uh, story-wise, we were interested in those two people. Uh, it would be so easy to say, well, I wrote my mother a letter today, or I haven't heard from my father lately, uh -huh. but those items are inconsequential. So why bother with them? Uh -huh. It's like, uh, it's like, painting, if you take a certain painter, he can't be one minute like Cezanne and the next section of his picture like Grandma Moses. Well, one thing that occurs to me, Hitch, is that isolation of the sort this gentleman is talking about implies obsession. And it struck me that these are all people who would be paying very little attention 
to the world outside because each is obsessed in some way well, with his problem. Well, that is true. Problem. That, that is true. And, uh, you know, uh, after all, take myself. I'm a loner. I don't know anyone around this town except in our profession. Mm -hmm. Not a soul. Exactly. Do we have another question then from uh, Chicago? Mr. Hitchcock, uh, Frank Hunter of the uh, St. Louis Globe Democrat. Your work has always suggested to me that you uh, might be easily bored by commonplace occurrences. Uh, uh, if so, uh, what do you like to do yourself for excitement and amusement when you're not making a picture? Uh, reading biography. I've just finished reading a book on the South African Boer War. Another question. Um, Christine Allen from the Chicago Daily News. Uh, the more time that you spend making films, the, the more time that you spend as a film director, do you find that the process gets easier or more difficult or more or less enjoyable? Has, has it changed for you at all over the years? Has, has, has the process of making films changed for you at all? Is it more or less the same enjoyable? Uh, it's enjoyable to the extent if you're successful in avoiding the cliché. But that seems to be the one thing uh, that obsesses me uh, in, uh, in making a picture, is trying, not always succeeding, but trying to avoid the cliché. I mean, uh, <clears throat> I remember when I made that movie, North by Northwest, we did a journey from New York to Chicago on the 20th Century, century Limited. And I'd always noticed in all pictures concerning trains and why they would do it, I have the faintest idea. But they seemed to take the audience off the train and stand them in a field so they could all watch the train go by. And once the train had gone by, they all got back on the train again. <laughs> so what I did in the, in the North by Northwest, I went to the end of the corridor of the traveling train and opened the top half of the iron door and had a special rack made and let the camera slide out and let it see the curve of the train. So I didn't take the camera off the train to have a look at it from a distance. Now the cliché of uh, putting the audience in the field to watch the train go by, they still do today. And it's accepted. Do we have another question? Gene Sisko from the Tribune in Chicago. Uh, you talked about reading uh, biographies for pleasure. What about uh, seeing films these days. Have you seen anything recently that you've enjoyed and could you be specific about what you enjoyed about that film? No, I haven't because I've been much too busy uh, in the editing and uh, cleaning up process which has taken several months and uh, I like to go to bed at nine o'clock if possible. So that stops me going out. But otherwise, now that things are easing up, I'll begin to look at films again. Do we have another question? Augusta Callery again. You said you weren't all that religious. Are there any of the psychic phenomena that you take seriously? Psychic phenomena? Which you take seriously? Uh, hunger? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Do we have another question? I think that's all from here. All right. Uh, we have some more questions here in Los Angeles. Uh, gentleman in the back row. John Simon from the San Diego Evening Tribune. <clears throat> you suggested earlier that perhaps uh, it was inappropriate now to put Polly on the track since uh, the woman is no longer perhaps the weaker sex and makes a less credible villain. However, we still have uh, small children, and they've been used to some extent to, as uh, victims in uh, suspense films. But I rarely see small children in Hitchcock films. Uh, could you comment on that? I've made, uh, made them with small children and used them symbolically. I made a film 
called, uh, they called it in this country, The Girl Was Young. I wanted to do a murder story uh, concerning young people. And uh, uh, the young man who is alleged to be the murderer escapes and is helped by the chief superintendent of the police's daughter. And she said, oh, I've got to go to my aunt's. And at her aunt's, it's a children's party, and they're playing blind man's buff. And auntie is blind man, and she gropes around the room and gropes after the accused murderer. And for, when it arrived in this country, for some unknown reason, the distributors cut that scene out. And yet, to me, it was symbolic of a children's game and a murderer, and the elements went together. There's also the child carrying the bomb, of course. Oh, the boy, the, Conrad, the teenage yeah. boy carrying the bomb across London in the picture called The Woman Alone. But there have been other stories not made by me, like High Wind in Jamaica. That's a, a group of evil children. Over here, you haven't had a chance. Robert Kendall with Hollywood Studio Magazine. I've been reading that uh, Janet Lee still gets hate mail from the picture Psycho. And I was wondering, number one, if you can figure out any reason why the impact of that motion picture had such a tremendous effect that people still react to it. And number two, is there any other motion picture that people reacted to like this over a period of years? I, I don't know one uh, of why she should receive hate mail when she was the victim. That's right. I can't figure it out. I can't figure that out. You know, I once <clears throat> had a letter from a man who said, my daughter once saw the French film Diabolique. That's where the man rises out of the tub. And he said, we, can't, we couldn't get her to take a tub anymore. <laughs> and now she's seen Psycho, she won't take a shower. <laughs> and she's been... been very, very difficult to be around. <laughs> what should I do? And I said, dear sir, send her to the dry cleaner. <laughs> Gentleman here. Uh, Ron Pennington, The Hollywood Reporter. You say that most of your improvising is done in the office, but do you ha then have a long rehearsal period in which the actors are allowed to improvise not dialogue but emotion reaction? No, because the picture having been made on paper, all I request of them is to read. Very set then. <laughs> right here. If you were to be approached and someone asked you to take five films which represented the best of your talents, what would, which films of yours would you choose? Oh, I don't know. I'd have to go a long way back. I'd go back to 39 Steps, possibly uh, Rear Window, um, the original Lodger, which was about Jack the Ripper. And I think, uh, if I'm allowed to say so, maybe Family Plot. Oh, for heaven's sake. <laughs> How about Vertigo? I'm kidding. How about Vertigo? Vertigo? I enjoyed it. Uh, in the sense that it has a <coughs> growing reputation, uh, in a sense, growing since its release. It uh, has. So that many has of us, I think, of. Over the years, I, I remember. I remember uh, an English report, and uh, it said of Vertigo, we cannot understand why the French chose Vertigo as one of their best ten films of the year. Mm. But I think its growing reputation is uh, yes. its more than a cult. I think people are beginning to recognize it for the extraordinary uh, work yes. that it is. Yes. Uh. Yeah. Do you give any thought at all to retirement? Uh, is making a film these days more exhausting, and ha have you been told to lose weight? <laughs> I'm losing weight all the time. All this morning I've been losing weight, <laughs> answering these questions. <laughs> have you given any thought to retirement? Or? Retirement? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> Way to go. <laughs> Uh, yes, this lady. We all wish you a much longer and very continuously productive life, but since this movie is called Family Plot, what would you like to have inscribed on your tombstone? 
I don't know. I suppose it's um, something to the effect quotes you can see what can happen to you if you aren't a good boy. <laughs> Unquote. Well, I feel that uh, Hitch has been an awfully good boy this morning and uh, that we have uh, reached uh, a point at which uh, we might reasonably break this up. Uh, it's uh, been a pleasure for me once again to be here with Alfred Hitchcock. I again thank him uh, for his presence and for his work. And I thank all of you for coming out and being so intelligent so early in the morning. Thank you, and uh, goodbye. This has been the Alfred Hitchcock Press Conference, originating in Burbank, California. We want to thank all of you for your participation, and we hope you've enjoyed it. Your announcer has been Donald Rickles.